Um, welcome to Wacky Wall Walkers. This is a uh, conversation about the relationship between comics and fine art. Uh, this panel has been gr generously sponsored by the Art Institute of Chicago and their current feature ex exhibition, uh, Roy Lichtenstein, A Retrospective, which is now on view uh, until September 3rd uh, at the museum, which is nearby uh, 111 South Michigan. Um, my name is Joe. Hi. Um, uh, this is Carl Worsom. Uh, he's been exhibiting his paintings and sculptures and drawings uh, since the mid-1960s in Chicago and was part of the definitive Harry Who group exhibitions at the Hyde Park Art Center in the late 60s, uh, which also included Jim Nett, Gladys Nilsson, James Falconer, and Sue Ellen Roca, as well as Art Green. Um, Carl's work features morphological cartoon-based figures acting in bizarre scenes which are set amid a world of intense colorscapes. Um, his work has been collected by such renowned institutions as the Art Institute of Chicago, the MCA, the Smithsonian, and the Whitney, among many others. Um, he lives and works in Chicago and teaches at SAIC. Um, he has a, had a tremendous influence um, on a younger generation of artists working in comics and art. Um, and we also have Paul Nudd, uh, who's a Chicago artist whose paintings depict, depict excuse me, microscopic bacterial life forms and cartoonishly terrifying mutants besotted with tumors, warts, lesions, growths, and both male and female genitalia and misplaced pubic hair. Um, <laughs> he was recently featured in the show Seeing His Way of Thinking, a gymnut companion at the MCA, and is represented locally by Western Exhibitions. Um, Nutt is also the editor of the ingeniously designed comics anthology Corpus Corpus, uh, is issue four, which debuted at Cake today. Um, and also, he is a curator. Um, he's the curator of uh, the recent show Blacklight, which opened at Hyde Park Art Center and has traveled to Richmond, um, as well as co-curating the cake show, Eat Before We Eat You, which the opening is tonight uh, following the, the panel. So, uh, welcome. So I prepared uh, a round of slides of Carl and Paul's work, and we're just gonna discuss some of these works and kind of uh, go through them. Carl has uh, stuff first. And I pulled these uh, images because I thought it'd be fitting for a comics exhibition. Um, this is a, um, a piece by Carl uh, where he has entered a Dick Tracy, How to Drag Dick Tracy the Hard Way. Um, and he's, I think this was a late submission. Yeah, this was for, uh, is this communicating here or not? Uh, this particular painting was uh, a latter edition that uh, the Gonsfeld Press wanted me to to do, they were uh, including my original four, which I believe will be following this, I would assume. But uh, so this one was more an updating of Dick Tracy at the drawing board and uh, kind of trying to enter his own contest again, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Is that you or Chester Gould? Pardon? Is this supposed to be you or Chester Gould? It, well, it's actually Dick Tracy. It's oh, Dick Tracy. He's drawing drawing, himself. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. Giving up the detective business and getting into. Uh, the old uh, drawing situation. I have to hand it to you. That is the coolest lettering I think I've ever seen. Uh, it's, it's pretty solid. Um, so we have, uh, this is the beginning strip, and uh, this is Carl, is, uh, is the last entrant, enterant, and, uh, of this contest here. Yeah, these, this is uh, one, there, I did four, and I, uh, so this is two of them, mm -hmm. and uh, those were the earlier ones. I'm not sure exactly what the date on that was, but uh, probably in the 70s, maybe. I think it was 73 is what I thought I 73, saw. 73, okay, yeah. Whereas um, the other one was uh, fairly recent, a couple of years ago when the uh, publication came out. Were, were these ones? Or? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Later in 73. So, so are you um, retroactively entering this contest? Not, not really, no. It was past <laughs> due. Uh, Chester Gould... Uh, gave up his uh, leadership on the, on the strip, and uh, supposedly there was some open uh, contest uh, uh, that was delivered to me later, uh, be, after it was closed off, uh, and so I just decided to do a last entrant and do the frontal view of Dick Tracy with the, this, the classic side view where he has the kind of hatchet nose and gives a you know, perfect profile there. I like the bullets bouncing yeah. in the back. Ping, ping. Yeah, and Chester Gould did a lot of this ricochet bullet things in his uh, various strips. And th this is uh, your take on um, Ernie Bushmiller's Nancy. Uh, 
Was this just for fun or was this also another contest? No, no contest <laughs> involved in this one. Uh, this was the premise of this, I did several of these as well, uh, was to, uh, Nancy has the classic uh, hairdo that kind of stays constant throughout all their frazzled uh, activities. And so I just wanted to show some variation of the, uh, the hairdo, but uh, using you know similar kind of hair quality that she displayed. And then with Sluggo, he was always getting in some kind of battle, always encountering some uh, Those black eyes? Yeah, and so those are different black eyes that he kind of achieved <laughs> through the years. It's, it's wonderful. So uh, were Bushmiller and, um, and Chester Gould were influences on, on you at a young age, would you say? Or? Yeah, uh, right. I, particularly Chester Gould is a you know, real, uh, before even getting into school, I w would uh, really gravitate to his uh, activities there and his distortion. You know, the criminals were very distorted. And the strip itself, although the premise of being a realistic strip, uh, you had kind of uh, people like uh, Milton Kniff, who was doing this realistic kind of uh, photographic-based uh, imagery of the, of the various uh, war zone situations, uh, as a kind of counterbalance to this very stylized reality that Chester Gould had. And uh, so that was one, and then Ernie, Bushmiller was another, the, just the, the other side of the equation of the humor and the, you know, the various uh, kind of strange circumstances that she would get into. It's moving on. So this is also comics you made for um, the early uh, Hyde Park Art Center shows um, where actual, the catalogs were actually in comic book form. And I think this is uh, one of, you don't really work in narratives like this too often. This was kind of a special occasion, I guess. Uh, yeah, well, it wasn't really, I mean, that is similar to, in a way, the Nancy and Sluggo and the Dick Tracy. It is a kind of sequence going through various uh, 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 incarnations of maybe more self-portraiture here. Uh, there was some reference to... Uh, where the dialogue goes, uh, something about uh, wearing it, my it took me, suit. It, it took me 27 years yeah. to get this cute all up in here in my Maxwell St Street suit. Correct, right. So that's it. Uh, so I did a lot of uh, shopping at Maxwell Street, and, uh, and I did have not a suit but an awning hat, <laughs> which I got in New Orleans. But, uh, so that was, I wanted to get some kind of an awning suit that go along with that. Uh, but this was kind of different variations, some uh, uh, wrestler's masks and uh, just the kind of uh, amoeboid shape distortion kind of thing and th as this well. Is, this is very early on. This is like 68, I would say? Uh, yes, uh, 68 or uh, 67. Some, and th that's yeah. like right as well when underground comics were coming out. So this is very, very groundbreaking when this was printed. Uh, there was not a lot going on that was like this at the time. It's very, very surprising. Mm -hmm. um, and ingenious, I think. But, um, well, moving on, this is, I picked comic book stuff in the beginning because of the cake art show. Here's a flyer you made um, for one of your shows, I think. Um, I, there, we have a pamphlet file on you in the museum with old uh, weird kind of just flyers and things. I thought this was really interesting. So you made a flyer for your own, uh, one of your own art shows. Um, yeah, it was more of a poster kind of situation, actually, versus, mm. you know, oh, yeah, I, I think of flyers being a smaller, that was a uh, a fairly, you know, standard size kind of poster that they would have, yeah, they had a kind of enamel finish to it, a gloss kind of finish, <coughs> and uh, yeah. Um, and this was uh, another one that we had, uh, was a, for a drawing show, um, and I hadn't seen a lot of images um, after this of like the, the, the woman with like kind of the dog uh, mm -hmm. for features. Um, and there was an interview inside with um, Roger Brown, uh, and it was, Really, really interesting interview. Um, I took some notes on it, but mm. um, he asked you about your influences, and you had cited, I think, um, Dr. Scholl's foot pad ads, mm -hmm. uh, meat advertisements, Coca-Cola and Pepsi advertisements, um, circus toys. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember what else. <laughs> well, the image, that, yeah, those were a, a number of things. Uh, the image that one recalls is more seeing a film Italian film on um, a circus performer who was hair suit had you know very hairy quality, and uh, 
and so these dog girls, I did a number of them that featured the, this dog woman that uh, was uh, kind of based on the hair suit woman. Um, here's another uh, thing with hair, uh, and it's a, another kind of sequential. This is from the same Harry Who catalog, um, but it's another example of you working in kind of like printed sequence. Right. Which after yeah. this you don't really see. Yeah, the, where it continues on. I, th I think one of the things as a kid, I wanted to be a comic artist, and there, th these pages that are being shown is an example where I couldn't take a character and run it through a series of narrative explorations with different kind of the same face with this different formation. So, uh, so I gravitated some other kind of format of art. And uh, this is an example of where I'm kind of taking this one woman maybe through different hairstyles and you know the last one after going into the water and kind of destroying all Decompresses. the... Decompresses. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is gargoyle gargle oil. Mm -hmm. um, this is um, on kind of like a bathroom mirror. I thought this was kind of ingenious. Well this um, one is another uh, a reference to Dick Tracy actually. He had a uh, a uh, criminal called Gargles, who was uh, peddling uh, mouthwash to all the pharmacists, and, <laughs> and rather than, uh, you know, like the bootleg times when they were kind of uh, taking over the bootleg business and forcing people to buy certain products of the, in the mob. Uh, and so this was a similar kind of thing uh, with mouthwash, and he had this uh, he, uh, bathrobe that he'd be gargling with and then telling his henchmen to do such and such. And uh, <laughs> so I also, at this time, did a number of different products. And so I combined two things with the gargle oil and uh, gargles. And then this is on a mirrored surface. So uh, I did this on a, a glass panel and uh, mask off the area that was going to be painted and then had it mirrorized and then painted in that empty area there. Wow, I don't think I've ever seen that in person, mm -hmm. but yeah. yeah it, so that simulates a, a cabinet there, you see a little knob. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I found the drawing for it too that I thought was very interesting. Mm -hmm. It's changed a lot um, between the drawing and the, the final piece. It's even reversed. Right, right. Um, and then the, the, the band tying his face up is a lot different. A lot of the features have changed too, so mm -hmm. do you change your yeah, drawing, this is a good, uh, I'm glad you brought that in there, because this is a good indication where I have a final product, and then preceding that, there's a number of uh, drawing possibilities or options. It's kind of like testing for, uh, like casting for some sort of, in a film, casting for your uh, various stars. And so I kind of, my stars are the different drawings that uh, are gravitating around a certain idea. And uh, so this was one possibility. I did a number of other, other drawings as uh, well. How many drawings do you normally make of a painting? Are you kind of, do you do it in like parts and pieces and then kind of cobble it together? Uh, you... Well, sometimes, uh, sometimes it's the whole image that, you know, I keep transforming. So it, there's no real formula for it. And I do not work, uh, you know, from one to A to Z kind of thing that I have a number of different uh, uh, possibility, different paintings or different out, end outcomes and uh, uh, in, in all those different circumstances I'm doing drawings relating to, to other ones and then sometimes another drawing emerges and takes precedence and then that becomes the, the front runner to what I want to ultimately do. So there's uh, a lot of my work, is, uh, most of my work is done in the drawing format and a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of ideas out there that never get uh, taken to the final resolution. <clears throat> and this was a drawing that you had sent me. I, mm -hmm. I feel like um, drawing is something that it really isn't prevalent in fine arts these days. Um, and I feel like comic art is, is kind of carrying the torch with drawing because it's very heavily drawing based. <laughs> um, right, yeah. Uh, and I feel like that's kind of frowned upon in academia mm -hmm. is this classic notion of drawing, but you seem to have, I mean, even like the 70s, uh, mm -hmm. when it was still kind of not as popular as it once was, um, just did it without kind of caring what you were told. Mm -hmm. uh, and that goes for other people in the, um, that you were working with at the time. Mm 
Um, so like, I guess drawing, I guess, is, is very important to your process. Um, yeah, as, as I just, yeah, I had just, uh, you kind of make an appropriate uh, statement here. You know, just prior to what I was saying, that the drawing is my major, you know, I really like to work as drawing because it allows me more free play, more invention, more association, and then the, either it's a sculptural piece or a drawing or even a print, which is drawing based, uh, that's more, uh, a little bit like washing the dishes or drying the dishes. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, just a craft kind of thing to finish it off, but it doesn't have the same enthusiasm associated with it. Yeah, next, these are some more drawings that you had sent that you wanted to show. Mm -hmm. um, this is like the... The prior one, by the way, was uh, the uh, kind of riff on the idea when health freezes over, you have the... <laughs> the devil doing we'll get a, this thing out of here. a snow uh, <laughs> s snow plow kind of thing, <clears throat> and there's just a little bit of flame on this on the little snowball. It's ice on fire, yeah. cold heat, um, and this looks like some uh, harpies or something. I well, think. yeah, some some birds there. I w I've, I haven't finished. You know, this is one that I'm still kind of doing one one drawing for this idea of. Uh, uh, the statement of fair weather friends uh, stick together kind of thing and this is like some kind of a electrical storm that uh, that one kind of blue bolt there is uh, referencing and then the birds are kind of scattering all over the place. This is colored pencil? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. I haven't used colored pencil in a while but you, you sure do nice stuff with it. This is also colored pencil. Yeah. This is, um, oh, what was the name of this one? Big mouth log sitter. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, this is kind of another idea in terms, of, again, the verbal kind of uh, sitting uh, like a bump on a log. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I made a print of this ultimately. And uh, it was also a, a kind of fly coming in. So this kind of, I saw a, uh, a, a post, not a poster, but a, uh, a banner of a river view. I'm uh, not a river view, but a, a, a side show kind of banner and it had some guy that was like frog boy or something and he had a big big mouth and there was a bug starting to come at, into his mouth and so I I kind of appropriated that idea and did my own version of the kind of large mouth kind of guy there. <laughs> um, this is Pop X, I think, was that the name of this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's go through these a little bit faster I think and we'll right. get to talking. Um, this is a very interesting one. What, what this is more kind of <laughs> aliens. And I, I'm working on a number of uh, paintings that, uh, this is a drawing, but uh, that involve uh, pulling kind of flesh or... Uh, oh, taffy. Yeah, and so this is like a ta the idea. It's kind of an alien, kind of two alien women that uh, one is kind of uh, pulling the other's... Uh, flesh and it's kind of a taffy pull type flesh kind of situation. The, the, the one's face reminds me of the female gremlin from Gremlins 2. Mm -hmm. Like it's almost <laughs> uncanny, I don't know. Yeah. Did there was like, no, you there, there was no uh, <laughs> conscious effort at that. This is, um, wait, teeter-totter. Mm -hmm. Is this, this also recent? These are yeah, ones right. that you sent me are... Right. Uh, this one, it, there's this one phenomenon that's going on, whether it's an actual th situation or not, I'm not sure, but there's uh, extreme ironing where you have individuals going on top of high peaks and carting an ironing board up there and um, to kind of ironing their pants. <laughs> so I have some with ironing boards up. This one doesn't have any. And so, uh, but the pants are really kind of really... The pants pressing. and shoes are yeah. Yeah, just a lot different than the rest of the drawing. Right. And he has a little bit of uh, this safety uh, kind of vest on. There's uh, some water underneath there, so <laughs> he'll be safe. <laughs> uh, this is you in 1970 yeah. um, posing with your artwork. Right. You were, like, really cool and mm -hmm. by today's standards. <laughs> uh, people would probably pay around $300 for that, for that outfit these days. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty valuable. I, I like that uh, shirt, but... I do too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you right. still have it? There are f a few of my old shirts I have. I don't think I have that one any longer, but there are a yeah, few we were I, talking about that I've, I've hung on. We were talking about that yeah. Yeah. 
So, uh, and I think I read an interview too that when you, you wore really baggy clothes because it was kind of like having your own personal wind tunnel. <laughs> Uh, that's, uh, I, don't, I don't recall that quote, but I'm sure. I'll see if I can pull it up. Yeah. Um, but it looks like, I don't think I've seen the sculpture or the, or the sewn piece before either. Yeah, uh, or the what piece? The, or the crochet. Oh, yeah, 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 that's a macrame. Uh, uh, I got a book on knots, uh, sailor's knots, and uh, so I took some of the po knot possibilities and made a, a little macrame uh, Creature there, this and then like the other one was just a cigar smoking uh, head, a bus kind of situation there. Uh, is it like plaster and then painted, or uh, like, uh, it's? Uh, I think it was paper mache. I, I did some pa uh, plaster cast, but I don't think that was one of them. I did a pinhead, one of the pinheads in the freaks. Oh, that yeah. was a plaster cast, and I would, uh, and she had a shaved head. And I was going to do a number of them. One, this last, I only did one. One, uh, it was going to be all of these kind of puns on pin. And uh, she had a rolling pin on, that goes from here to there on her head. Um, this looked like a really interesting issue, the, the, high, the headline above Carl's head. Is, Peeping Tom's Guide to the Lakefront. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Yeah, Pussycat City for Night Owls, and mm. is the sky really falling in Chicago? Oh, wow, yeah. When these guys are in charge, you know. Um, this, is where, this is more painting work, I guess. Yeah, this is a painting know. right here, and it's a um, parking lot attendance. attendance, right. Yeah. And it uh, deals with going to a Bulls game back in the 70s. They, I mean, they still do with the parking lot attendants kind of do all these gyrations to get the various individuals to... Uh, they, like park their cars. In yeah, the park lot. the cars exactly. So this <laughs> is that uh, phenomena there. Now they just have flags and like. Yeah, you know, right, right. Some have <laughs> kind of costumes and things. Yeah. Um, this I thought was interesting because it, it I mean, it's cliche. It's a, a word bubble, but mm -hmm. it really does kind of represent voice. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I see in this piece, and it, it kind of makes a noise in my head when I look at it. Kind of like. Rrr. Right. <laughs> it, it is a yeah it is a voice balloon and it's kind of like uh that this individual another alien being here uh, said something and want you know the idea when you say something sometimes you say "Ooh, i want to take that back and so this is like oh, she like has said it. something and wants to kind of reverse the procedure so that little uh nodule that's sticking out there is new, usually related more to the mouth so it's kind of going in reverse going back into the mouth I wish you could actually do that sometimes. I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, this is the, the, uh, what Carl is probably his most well-known image uh, is the Screamin' Jay Hawkins, which was uh, translated into a record cover, mm -hmm. I think on, was it Capitol Records? Uh, I think it, what was it originally? Do you, uh, I'm not or sure. Columbia. Uh, well, it may be, yeah, I'm not sure what the original one was. I had a friend that worked at <laughs> the record company, which I don't remember which one it is. But uh, I did the painting prior to that, and he knew about it, and they were going to re return. Screaming Jay was going to make a, uh, a record after many years, and, uh, and so that was going to be the on coming back kind of record. Uh, and so he, one of the uh, great things for me was that he approved the, the artwork, even though I misspelled his name there, <laughs> uh, to line up with Jay, Jay the, the Blue Jay kind of thing. I feel like this wouldn't get past many art directors today. You know, it's like we've like f regressed or something with like album artwork. It's, you know, I wish everything looked like this that I listened to. Well, now you don't even have album covers anymore. It's no. It's digital. I mean, it's pretty reduced now, yeah. And what, what is armpit rubber? Well, th that is uh, kind of representative of the uh, studio. I mean, not the studio, the audience. And you have these performers that uh, really work up a great amount of sweat. And so the people in the front row, uh, a lot of times, get sprayed a little bit. And so <laughs> those people in the front row would be wearing one of these kind of uh, total rubber suits. <laughs> They'd be pretty sweaty themselves after getting through oh, with it. This is Carl Barks influenced, I think. Are you a Carl Barks guy? <laughs> a Groucho Marx guy, no, as uh, Groucho would say, not a uh, Carl Marx. Oh, yeah. Carl Barks, he, he did... Um, oh, Carl Barks, I think yeah. he said Carl Marx. Now, okay, yeah. <laughs> Bar arf, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 
he Carl did Marx, Uncle, yeah, Uncle definitely. Scrooge, com- yeah. the, the Duck comics. Right, right, definitely. Uh, and that does definitely refer to the uh, Donald Duck character. There's, there's there's some always sort of adventure. His uh, nephews were always taking him out into nature, and he w- didn't do too well with that. And so this is a little bit of... He got bit by a mosquito or something, and he's... He severed his fingers off or yeah, something. He's, <laughs> he's turning blue. Right. <laughs> so. oh, that's one of my favorites. Um, this is called, uh, Between the Space of Flowers, They Tied Rocks to Attention. Um, and it, it kind of reminds I me of... Um, the, wait, go ahead. The Man A, I guess. The Man A, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, like sitting on the, the you mean the Manet or, or the Monet? The, the, the Manet is the guy that has picnic in the yeah in the yeah grass Manet with, yeah. yeah yeah okay. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. Well, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, I could see maybe the Monet with uh, his uh, garden, you know, the water thing. Uh, but no, it, this is more one of those apocalyptic landscape kind of things where after, <laughs> you know, desecration of the of the the land kind mm. of aspect, so it's a little bit more commentary on that. I, I, I like how the figure is black and white amidst like this just technicolor in, like landscape. You know, it's just it's very impacting. Um. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I like that kind. Of, I do that. I've done that several times with the the black and white image of the figurative component and then other things. Full technicolor. Um, also, the use of color in this too, I thought was extremely interesting mm-hmm. too. Um, the way the the rainbows are kind of trailing from behind him, and his pants are kind of all cut up, mm-hmm. and then there's like outer space in his body, and he's also like blue. I, how do you come up with these like color schemes? Do you, is there a lot of like um, trial and error, or like do um, you have certain patterns you like to work with? Because yeah, I I don't have any kind of palette. You know, I'm kind of. Uh, Necessarily, you know, I, I, each painting has a different kind of possibility, and uh, it's a little bit more intuitive. I don't have any real plans on it. Is this what, it, what's the title of this one? This is things. No, this is uh, unmixedly at ease. No, oh. I, I know what it, it's referring to. Uh, by the equator, there's you know this kind of ex- going from day to night, very extreme kind of thing, and so it's it's that kind of aspect of this kind of rainbow daytime situation into this night kind of aspect. Let's see here. Oh, and then there's some sculptural works. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carl also works in sculpture. This is genuine genie wine. Yeah, this is another side view reference there. There was uh, this uh, amusement park here that was called Riverview, and one act was uh, a guy that uh, took a 7-Up bottle. He was a half man, and he would hop on the top of the 7-Up bottle and do the time was... Uh, the twist was really in, and he would do the, the twist on the top of the seven up bottle. <laughs> so this little, and I think, I don't know if that's, it's another one of those product things here. I don't know if that was gargoyle. I can't read it right now. But, um, it is, what is? This is called Genuine Genie Wine. Yeah, oh yeah, that's, that's right. Okay, that's <laughs> the product, Genuine Genie Wine, right. <laughs> W-I-N-E. Um, and then these are some other kind of, uh, um, constructions. Yeah. Um, the, the first one is Binocchio, and he's mm-hmm. out for ice cream. Um, mm-hmm. Tic Tac Toad, and the Phantom of Hackle Park, mm-hmm. which I thought was like really because you get like this weird kind of uh, atmosphere, like you're in the, this park at night or something, and this like smoke breathing weird like <laughs> transformer is going to come and kill you. <laughs> you know? It's uh, yeah. Well, that is you're reading it right in terms of it is a national park idea. And I was thinking of it more like a guard figure that would uh, protect uh, from, you know, various uh, nefarious people in a in a national park. So maybe I'm nefarious. I think he's <laughs> imposing to, uh, to me. Yeah. Being in the well, park that's supposed to use. Okay. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think we're getting into Paul's stuff now. This is right. Paul's there work. There it is. Yeah. Um, you're up, Paul. You haven't said anything the whole time. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> But now we're going to talk a lot. So, um, and these are recent works of yours. This is um, uh, what kind of medium are you using here? Uh, you know, like drawings. Actually, a pretty good segue. These are pretty large drawings, um, about ninety-five inches. I wonder if that is seven or eight feet tall. Um, slightly larger than life size, and they're made with uh, fairly traditional art materials: watercolor, acrylic, acrylic inks, pen and ink. Colored pencils, things like that. Watercolored pencils. 
I think this was this the piece that was in the Net Companion show. Is yeah, that, that was the piece that was at the um, MCA. the MCA, and a lot of people don't uh, enunciate words the way I do, but I just want to differentiate between nud and nut. <laughs> so, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that was at the MCA um, in January in uh, last year, last year for the Jim Nut show. Um, <laughs> Carl had work in that show too, I think. <laughs> Yes, lots of people did. It was a big show. <laughs> um, you guys shown together. Uh, this is uh, another. But they're on paper one. too. They're on paper, and they kind of hang loosely because they're pretty large. And, um. <clears throat> and these are kind of like figurative works that you can kind of make out the the body parts. Yeah, and the, they start the nervous system. They kind of start out just as a basic. Um, I teach elementary school, and one of the. Uh, one of my favorite projects that the kids do is that it's like a human anatomy um, project and the kids kind of lay down and they trace themselves and then they kind of, uh, you know, draw all where the organs are supposed to go and everything. So having looked at these for like five or six years in a row, I was like, I got to make something like that. Um, so I, I don't use any source material. I just kind of, um, you know, draw just from whatever's in my mind. Uh, so I had, uh, I traced my wife and then added like a head on top of that. <laughs> so she kind of posed for me a little bit. It's pretty. And then I just kind of like started kind of adding layers and layers of material. And it's a fairly, um, it's like a fairly experimental process. You know, I mean, it's not, uh, you know, I, I try to keep the drawing kind of lively. And, you know, instead of just kind of coloring it in and filling it in, I kind of... Um, you know, I'll just put down like a layer of black ink and then put colored pencils. Just the way these kind of materials work together is a big, a big part of making them. How so. long does it take you to make a piece like this size? Like it's pretty detailed. I think I have a detail shot in um, of some of the like this is like pretty close. This isn't one of the same pieces, but no, that's that's not a detail. That's something different. Oh, that's different. Okay, I yeah, think you can fun. see some details kind of in this. You could probably just zoom in. Uh, I, on the, I don't know if the resolution is good enough. That really. Yeah, they're they're pretty highly detailed. Well, the one on the one that's up now, those are two detail shots of the right. one on the left. That's not the whole piece. The whole piece is on the on the left there. Um, mm. Yeah, they're they're fairly detailed for sure. Uh, it's hard for me to really gauge like how long things take because I have so many projects going on at the same time. Um, I just I just you know can I, I'm just not the kind of person that could work on one painting, finish it, and then move on to the next thing. It's just a a flood of different things, but. Um, I don't know, yeah. And uh, I guess uh, you were kind of influenced by comics as well. It may not be as apparent, but um, I think you said you were looking at Garbage Pail Kids. And oh, yeah, no that's doubt. totally related. So. Yeah, you know, it's, it's weird because, you know, I've been kind of like sorting out all these like weird influences. I never read comics when I was a kid uh, in terms of like genre stuff. But, um, you know, the, like the, first the Wacky Packages and then the Garbage Pail Kids just kind of like... Uh, you know, hit our elementary school when I was like nine or 10 and they were just really successful and a lot of kids had them and they were just really awesome and really funny, kind of just these amazing little gag paintings. Um, it wasn't until like years later, like even years after I read Mouse that I kind of put the piece together that like Art Spiegelman kind of spearheaded a lot of the, a lot of those projects and stuff and a lot of the guys were, were from MAD. Uh, uh, Jay Lynch, who was like a local Underground Comics guy did a lot of stuff. Did you ever meet Jay Lynch, Carl? Uh, no, no, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> but I do share the you know, the Garbage Bale kids were great. I, I I was a little older than nine, but I really liked them. <laughs> like, this guy coming into the store. In my yeah, garbage. certainly a big influence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, John Pound I think was one of the really great artists, and uh, that did a lot of the Garbage Pale kids paintings. Um, and I think you, Mad Magazine was like a big influence for you, right, Carl? Did you read um, Kurtzman? Uh, yeah, right. K Harvey Kurtzman was really great. He's classic. And, and, you know, he not only was contributor to uh, Mad, but the, the other EC comics, uh, he was kind of the art director and was responsible for that dense kind of compositional style that they empl the artists employed. And a lot of them, when they left uh, Mad, were they... They had the stylization, but they didn't have the uh, that kind of uh, intense kind of quality that Kurtzman uh, gave to them. I, I think he left in like the the late, I'm gonna say like '57, and he went off and did a couple projects on his own, like Humbug, uh, 
and then uh, like he took like Will Elder and Al Jaffe with him, uh, and then when they came back, it was just totally different as far as like energy and humor. Um, right. Um, and I think humor is apparent in both of your works. Um, I mean, I feel like they're also very serious. Like a lot of uh, Carl, I look at like a lot of your figures, and they have this. Some of them are very like kind of silly, but like a lot of them have this kind of cartoon seriousness and ominousness to them, uh, which like isn't funny, but they're like, you know, I don't know what your, if that's what your intent is, but some of them are like kind of like the Phantom of Hackle Park really like, scares me. I don't know. Yeah, it's not it's not all humor. I do have some things that are you know purely humor, but most of them are a little bit more that yeah that that, other, that edge what you're talking about. Um, this is another installation of um, uh, Paul Nudd's work. This is kind of um, reminds me of like a kind of like a war scene I would draw when I was like a kid or something with like little um, like guns and ships and things everywhere, like mazes or something like that. Yeah, they're kind of like these little battles, um, just of you know they they're essentially landscape paintings. Um, you know, in that there's and this is a series of like uh, six paintings or so and. Uh, that's actually, they, um, they were at the Hyde Park Art Center maybe five or six years ago. They're large, kind of unstretched paintings. Um, and, yeah, they're just kind of these kind of, like, weird, like, dyspeptic, toxic landscapes that are just spewing forth all this, like, you know, gunk. Just kind of come, they're kind of, they're kind of ridiculous, you know, in terms of the... In, um, that, you know, they start out as these kind of really flat, kind of, like, empty spaces, and they just kind of become so saturated and full uh, of stuff but you know they, they kind of they're nice to, to kind of walk up to because they're really textured and there's a lot of definition in them um, but yeah they're yeah, yeah I know what you mean like as far as making something you know somewhat serious that that has to do with like the history of painting and kind of respond some way to that that lineage um, but also kind of making it uh, you know kind of silly too I mean that's kind of like the that's kind of like the the problem that painting's been in for a for a while, I think. Or like terminal lung cancer drawings or something. <laughs> yeah. It's very well, that one's called the land of forty lungs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like life drawings. <laughs> and also like a lot of the imagery too. I was just kind of um, making these these weird kind of like like monuments, you know, like these kind of headstone kind of looking uh, Stonehenge looking things that were kind of like part of the landscape, but they were also kind of um, deteriorating or forming or whatever, uh, you know, kind of. Yeah, they're wonderful. Uh, and there's like a sculptural piece too, like that you, um, like in the center there, I guess. On the oh, floor. no, that's another artist. That's that was a two person okay. show, which I didn't know it was going to be a two person show, but I'm actually a big fan of the two person show format. I like, I like. <laughs> yeah, you had a really nice one with uh, Rachel Neffenegger a while ago. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, that was a nice yeah. show. That's where I got the title for our show, Eat Before We Eat You. It's from oh, a yeah? movie that she recommended, Troll 2, <laughs> which is just like, by some miraculous way, slipped by me. Like, <laughs> and I never saw it. <laughs> I think I've only seen Troll 1, but I hear 2 is way better. Yeah, is 2 that, yeah, is that way better. Um, and uh, this is some uh, printed collaborations you've uh, done with local artist, um, Jeremy Onsmith, or Onsmith. Uh, and he takes a lot of, um, uh, he's influenced by the, the, the Carl Worsom and, and people like that as well. But this is, how did you guys go about um, collaborating on this? Um, sort of, uh, kind of like, don't touch what I drew at first. You know, they were like, this is kind of a later one where actually you can see the guy's dick kind of touches the big monster's kind of tongue in the middle there and there's this big explosion <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Um, but at the, at the very first one, they were just very separated. Like you draw on your half of the paper, I draw on my half of the paper. Um, and don't look at me. Just kind of like a back and forth thing. I, I kind of remember I started most. I did most of the starts, right? I would kind of do the prompts, um, and then Jeremy would work on them. And usually just one one cycle back and forth. That would be a later one where we actually start to kind of um, intermingle, kind of different. Uh, different kind of elements and stuff. It's like a waltz, you know. What's that? It's kind of like a waltz. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and these were... Um, <laughs> 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 these, 
these were uh, just one color silk screens uh, that we made as a, a residency at um, Spudnik Press, uh, I think in 09 maybe, 08 or 09. And there was a suite of oh. 10 of them. And this is some, uh, this is some sculptural kind of uh, like model train set sort of, ba I'm not sure what your, biodome. Uh, the how, what, what was this from? I think this is some really interesting 3D work. Yeah, that was like, I, I kind of felt, I don't know, I just made this, it's kind of like a one-off sculpture um, that I made for a, another two-person show at Western Exhibitions like some time ago. And yeah, it was just kind of, I just went out and got all this, kind. it was like really intuitive. I just went out and got all this kind of, uh, this modeling stuff. And I started making these weird little uh, domes and kind of, Again, like just kind of like those little monuments that were in the paintings and everything. Uh, these again are really detailed. They're kind of made out of modeling clay, yeah. and and um, you know it's kind of like when you go into Joanne Fabrics and you just kind of want to start making something. Like I, <laughs> right I went there. out and got all this like felt and stuff, and it was kind of nice because my mother-in-law kind of helped me out a lot with it. Um, and it was, <laughs> it's weird because I've only really made this is like the only sculpture I've ever made. Um, yeah, and it, it was actually titled, I can't remember the name of the title, but it was like a, it was supposed to be like a graveyard, like this was like some sort of like, you know, I was looking at a lot of pictures of like crop circles and, and Stonehenge and just like, you know, just Blair Witch Project, kind of weird little stones put in circles and stuff, and I just kind of made this thing that, when you looked at it, it kind of seemed like whoever made it, it kind of made sense and things were... It also kind of looks like this weird industrial, like, power plant or, like, a sewage treatment plant. Nuclear. It was just really, yeah, it was just kind of uh, kind of vague, but, um, yeah, my personal memory of this is while I was making it, my wife went into labor, and um, <laughs> it wasn't finished. <laughs> yeah. yeah, every time I see but And that's in panels, too. I mean, you can uh, shift the pieces around. Oh. Uh, they were in, they're in, I think, uh, 9 by 12 or 8 by 10 wooden panels. So you can kind of take, um, you know, each little section out. Uh, and then, you know, you could exhibit them in a big line and stuff and just get more mileage out of it that way as, as far as exhibitions go. <laughs> so I guess you're also a curator. This is the show that's opening after Cake tonight. Um, but um, I guess I want to talk about kind of like, how do you curate shows that kind of incorporate comics and, and fine art at the same time? Or do you consider them different things, you know? Or? I, you know, I was kind of lucky because um, I went to University of Illinois in Champaign, and there was an art historian there. His name was John Feinberg. And he wrote a book called Art Since 1940. And it included, like, a lot of people that... Um, and it was really, like, an accessible book. It wasn't a real, like, kind of... Uh, theory kind of heavy book um it, it's worth reading from cover to cover just in terms of like an art historical survey book um and there was yeah there was a chapter called hc westerman peter saul and the harry who so i mean even when i was in undergrad uh the screaming jay hawkins um image was reproduced a lot of gladys nilsson's work um a lot of peter saul's and also at u of i there were um a number of really key um Peter Saul pieces that were in the collection there. One of them was typical Saigon, which is like this enormous kind of uh, Vietnam uh, painting that's just like really phenomenal. And it was kind of, uh, it was on display all the time. And, you know, Saul would do these crazy riffs on uh, a lot of art history. And there was a, a number of those paintings too. So for me, it was just kind of like, um, I just kind of accepted that as being part of kind of like the establishment. Mm -hmm. um, or to me, I didn't have a problem with it being, uh, you know, completely um, accepted by, like, art history or whatever. Um, but, you know, as, as a curator, I've curated probably, like, close to a dozen shows in the last, like, ten years or so. Um, but I do try to, like, self-consciously uh, just kind of, like, invite people that I feel are kind of underdogs, you know, and people that I feel have been unfairly kind of skipped over. Um, or just, you know, embrace, like, these sorts of aesthetics that I think um, don't really gel well with um, just traditional kind of art history, which I, which I find that, you know, um, I kind of find, like, a lot, of, a lot of stuff from the Midwest is always kind of 
kind of skipped over a lot of the time uh, in terms of like just legitimacy and I mean and things like that. So th that's always kind of like a, a premise that that I've always taken. You know, people like Nick Black, who I think is just a genius and. You know, he's just cobbling together shows in Pilsen at people's apartments still, and he's like 55 years old. You know, it's like, you know, I, I like, I like kind of, um, I, I just like trying to represent people like that, you know, through curation. You know, and it's fun too. I mean, it's it's enjoyable. <laughs> um, do you, I guess, like, well, Chicago kind of has this history of people working in like. Not comics necessarily, but comic influenced painting, uh, and it's it's hard to kind of classify. I guess you know. It, I mean, it, it's you kind of need to prepare someone to look at it that's not from Chicago because th they just think we're crazy or something. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like, did, it helps me just to like not make like really not classify stuff and really not kind of make yeah. distinctions. I mean, you can get into all sorts of like technical kind of formal. Discussions about, you know, looking at a comic book where you look at 50, 60, 100 separate images, whereas when you look at a painting, you look at one. Right. I mean, there's like, there's like very glaring differences between that whole thing. But, um, you know, I, I, just, I just like to think of things as being either good or not good or interesting or not interesting. Um, I don't make comics. I've never made a comic in my life, but I draw... <laughs> like a huge amount of influence and I just feel there's a lot of energy from people that do and like Carl was saying like I mean just the initial struggle of repeating a character yeah. um, throughout a panel I'm just like it just blows my mind when I see people that are able to Seriously. not only do that but just to spend the time to do that it's really uh, it's really inspiring but I feel like um, like you really don't need to necessarily do that and a lot of like newer comics or the stuff that I look at in Lumpen it isn't like this classical, like comics in the classical narrative sense in the world. Some things are very abstract and there's no characters, you know, it's just shapes kind of repeated or, you know, but you still can read it somehow. Like it's like in your mind, you're reading like this series of like shapes. I don't know how to, it's just this, the way your brain naturally processes images in sequence. Um, and, you know, a lot of it doesn't have to do with, I even kind of like when characters kind of morph over time in a lot of these like comics, like, like Andy Burkholder's work, you know, he some some he'll, he'll maintain like a a general shape sometimes, but sometimes it's just more about the face facial structure kind of changing. And even though there's no like story or narrative, like you still kind of process it in this way. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, it's still readable. And I feel like it's almost kind of like looking like when you look at a painting and and kind of try to understand what uh, and read a painting. It's kind of the same thing, but it's just a single image. You know? I feel like your work really works like that. As well, Carl. Um, do, do you, do, there's a high, a high level of narrative in a lot of your paintings. And how do you come up with stories? Like, Shocking me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, well, it's a various associative things again. I, uh, as I described in a few of the pieces there that I referenced, that uh, there's a core of an idea, and then I kind of build around that a little bit. Uh, and. Uh, think about uh, visual images around the so-called, you know, kind of narrative kind of component, if that is to be. Sure. But uh, some I have a lot more of elaborate uh, kind of story things that I, I, as I'm doing something, I, I start attaching ideas to it and uh, bringing things in. And that's the drawing again, which, which also builds uh, different options for me. So I have different narrative possibilities, different uh, visual kind of associations as well. Sure. So we got about 15 minutes left. I'd like to take some audience questions. Does anyone have any questions they would like to ask? No? <laughs> oh, black flag. So how do you feel about um, art being made today and kind of poster work or printmaking? Uh, how do you feel about art being made today and like printmaking work that's being made right now? Well, I'll, I'll go out first. Uh, I think a lot of the things that I see, is, you know, is, is very exciting in terms of the more graphic and uh, uh, alternative kinds of things. And, uh, you know, just stepping up, uh, not stepping, but taking the elevator up there. Uh, 
a lot of s stuff up there, man. It's it's incredible. And then I think the poster scene here is is quite phenomenal as well. Yeah, I should say too that this image was was oh, Keith Herzog, was made by Keith Herzog. Like yeah, it's not very prolific local Jeremy's. printmaker. Yeah, um, he's got a booth upstairs. Uh, his zines are just ridiculously amazing. Um, we're actually in a show together at Ono oh Doom Gallery right now. That's up. Um, Keith has a lot of work and some action figures that he made. Um, uh, another question, Ryan. So um, yeah, the question is. Um, would you like to talk about uh, the identity and history of Chicago and how it's influenced the kind of work that you make? I think historically people come to school here and then leave. <laughs> and it seems like a lot of these comics people have been, they've like stuck around for more than five years. So, it's like <laughs> so that's kind of awesome. Um, but yeah, like I was saying before, like, I mean, I don't really like, I don't know if I like, personally like align myself like geographically with like a certain place but i do i i just like a lot of the like the history of the of a lot of the art that's come out of this city um you know i just ha i just got back from uh, richmond virginia and i uh, traveled a whole show down here that originated at the at the hyde park arts center and there's a guy there um who uh who co-owns a gallery and and he was just telling me, he was just like, you know, you should be really thankful to, to live and work in a place like Chicago. And I was just like, well, you know, I'm like one of the people that lives in Chicago but reads the New York Times. And then you just like <laughs> go through the Times like art section, which is a daily art section. And it's just, there's just like so much more going on. Um, but he was just like, you know, New York will just like, it just chews you up and spits you out uh, and you're gone. And he was like, I'm at the point now, I mean, he's like, He's like 45 or so, and he's been dealing there for 20 years, and he's just like, I honestly think this city's for suckers. <laughs> you know, like living there, it's, I mean, the rents are just like completely out of control, and um, I went to UIC, and one of the things that, that Kerry Marshall told me when, when I was in his graduate class was like, you know, you can actually quietly kind of get your work done here. Um, the trick is getting it out of Chicago. Um, I mean, that's kind of like the big goal for everyone that's, that's still here, but I mean, I, I graduated with an MFA like 10 years ago and almost everybody's gone. Like there's, there's very few people that are kind of like hanging out here or so, um, but does that, does that answer your question? Carl's still here. Yeah, I, I think uh, on the same line there that uh, as a, a Chicago artist, uh, you are able to kind of, uh, kind of work, you know, navigate the kind of anonymity quality plays into the factor of being able just to do your own, kind of develop your own vision in effect and not be concerned about a certain kind of style that will sell and you know the kind of pressures of gallery uh, activity and the kind of art world per se. Uh, and you know for myself the number of uh, kinds of uh, qualities of the city itself, you know the kind of large expanse of it, the different kind of neighborhoods. Uh, uh, you know, it's just, and the different kind of weather phenomena that we get here, uh, the East Coast uh, does have winter, but it isn't as severe. Uh, you know, I kind of like these kind of more extreme kind of weather phenomena that we get here, uh, going from one season to the other. And uh, so, yeah, it's a, a definite uh, advantage, I think, from uh, uh, I see it as an advantage rather than a disadvantage, actually. I also like looking, just at looking at art history, and it seems like every time there's just kind of like a noticeable blip on the radar, it comes from like a Chicago artist or just a Midwestern artist in general. I mean, starting with like Ivan Albright and, you know, people like that. Um, I mean, it took... Um, yeah, I feel like Ed Paschke hasn't really been fully embraced the way that a lot of New York painters have been um, like years ago. You know, people like that, I kind of feel like it's it's kind of like a, a little bit of a struggle. And I know for sure that, I mean, I, I try to get to New York as much as I can, but it's like so far removed from, from what I'm doing, you know? And it's like, I just talk to people that are there and it is, it's like this kind of, um, you know, it's just dealing with like what what's selling in galleries and and just the whole market has become really grotesque there in terms of just the the number like the the amount of money things are sold for and what it actually is and 
Um, yeah, it's just it's just really insane. But I just try to you know focus on what I'm doing in the studio, and I kind of feel like I mean I don't have much to compare it to, but I feel like Chicago is a good place to do that, just to really focus on what you're doing because there's I don't know. We we definitely have a lot of great comics artists here. I don't know. It's it's a good place for that. Yeah, I mean, also the screen the screen printers and the and the comics artists. I think they're kind of, in my opinion, it's it's the, it's kind of the lifeblood, you know, of of the city. Um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the bigger galleries just can't sustain themselves here. Um, you know, there's just not a, a huge collector kind of. I mean, Chicago. Yeah, you know, I don't know. It's. it's <laughs> Um, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speak up. Wait a minute. There was something about me. Oh, there's. Oh. Yes. Alexander? So, kind of um, the tension between comics and comics type work and uh, how they exist and in, in are able to be viewed in galleries. And it's very difficult to explain this sort of thing because the line is just so vague, but. Um, as a curator, no, uh, Paul. I could start. Yep. Um, let me think for a minute. I don't know. <laughs> I guess, I don't know. I mean, I always kind of like very early on, I like to simplify things, and I like very early on just kind of like as a student of art history, which which I really love. I mean, I love um, I love 60s and 70s underground comics, but I also really love Marc Chagall and, you know, like a lot of like kind of painting and, and things like that. But I kind of feel like, um, and again, like the terminology is going to get in the way here, but I guess like cartooning or just that black, that flatness, the flat kind of dark outlined, black lined kind of imagery, I think it's kind of like the preeminent at least from like 1945 onward, I think it's like the preeminent sort of like American way of making images. You know what I mean? I think that like the, you know, I, I think what would be next would be like like abstract expressionism. If you separate art history into pop art and abstract expressionism after World War II, it's like, you know what I mean? I think that I think it's like um, I think a lot of images that you see come from kind of like a cartooning sort of sensibility and there's just a lot of that sort of graphic work in in the world if that makes any sense um you know as far as like uh i don't know like me making comics or i, I look at them for sure and I, I really enjoy looking at them but um i don't know if that made any sense at all sure did it okay yes it did <laughs> well i'm not sure if you're referring to the fact of uh uh, work made for reproduction uh, being exhibited or it was uh, just people that uh, have a kind of graphic kind of approach to the work that are maybe larger in scale or have a uh, different surface quality than uh, some sort of reproductive uh, component that is uh, operative in poster and, and uh, comic art. I mean, I guess the uh, one could say that a, a show that is uh, print-based would be, they, they would work into that kind of situation. I mean, that has a factor in fine arts where you have print media, and that certainly would uh, be what comics are. So uh, whether the original drawings that uh, have color added, where you have a lot of the, the pencil work and the pen work, and uh, so you, you get, it, it depends on, you know, in terms of a show, like what Paul was talking about, and maybe in terms of a curating situation, if you want something that shows the evolution and the, the process, or you want the final product aspect that really has the finesse and the... Uh, so I think, I think uh, there's enough galleries that have shown comic art, uh, and speaking of New York, there's a number of galleries that do show a lot of work that is uh, involved in comic art, and uh, I think Carl Hammer here has shown a lot of comic artists for one gallery. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think maybe like the lar the larger trend that I kind of like to think of is like, you know, like if you look at like there was a certain point where like 
comics were used as kind of subject matter and as content in works of art. Um, I kind of feel like there may be like a reversal of that now, like a lot of art world kind of, um, particularly like modernism and other, you know, if you look at like 60s kind of fluxus kind of stuff, mm -hmm. I think the comics world is drawing a lot from the art world kind of as kind of like an, a reversal. I, you know, I mean, I, that may be kind of unpopular <laughs> because, you know, there's, there's a lot of disdain between the two. I don't really make much distinction between the two. Um, but it kind of seems to me like before it was like, well, you know, if you live in like 19th century England, you're going to paint the landscape, you know, because that's like, that's like what you're around. Like, of course you're going to paint comics. Like when you're, when you grow up in the United States in the sixties, because that's what is in your house, you know, or that's what you're, you're kind of dealing with. It's just kind of like the, the objects that surround you is always what, what artists have, have kind of painted, um, or so, but I, I, I do kind of like like to think of it as this kind of reversal. I mean, if you look at a lot of con like contemporary comics work, they're really high, like they're really artistic. You know, I mean, in a different way than say, um, you know, the the stuff that was made maybe thirty, forty, fifty years ago. In in a different way, M much more modern looking, maybe, as opposed to uh, like a pre like a pre modern, just kind of like a narrative sort of thing. So. I don't really think about that that much. I mean, I, 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 you know, a lot of a lot of my imagery certainly comes from um, just the junkier end of popular culture. Uh, just growing up in the '80s, you know, the magazines in my house, like Mad, was pretty washed up, washed washed up by that, that point. Horrible. But I love the Al Jaffe. Um, uh, he's still doing that. He's like, if you go oh, yeah, get an issue Holden's? of Mad magazine, he's 92 years old. And he does the Mad Magazine fold in every every like other month or something. It's incredible, and it's all like Justin Bieber jokes. I'm like, how do you understand? <laughs> I don't even know what's funny about this, but this 92 year old guy can make jokes about like Lady Gaga and the internet. <laughs> like I don't, I do not understand. <laughs> I, uh, we would I never fold them in though. We would fold the one in at the store and then <laughs> yeah, buy, and the, buy mint, the other. The mint, yeah, buy that the was, mint. Condition. That was a major selling point actually. Uh, was the idea, because you'd have to buy one to keep and buy one to, to fold in. Well, I think, I think we're out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank Carl and Paul uh, for joining me up here tonight. So. And um, just make sure that uh, after uh, at the 6 o'clock at, um, what's it, 2, what's the address? 28 South Wabash, uh, Eat Before We Eat You, the official cake art show opens tonight. So see you there.